Next, I'd like to analyze the poem, and I brought a sample of her handwriting here today. This is signed earlier in the 50s, and you can see her pressure is very similar throughout. When I start to compare both of these together, you go over here to the poem, it's two different worlds. Yeah, they look absolutely nothing alike. Yeah. This was unfortunately penned in someone else's hand and not Marilyn Monroe's. And it could have been her sentiment. She might have shared that sentiment with someone that was writing for her, but she did not write that. Good day, folks. Today we will show you all the moments when Pawn Stars encounter scammers. I mean, the jersey feels authentic. I just, there's, I have no way of telling for sure that it's real. I'm very confident it's real. I mean, the way you know, my family cherished it, and the way my uncle was a sports collector. And just because it was in your family doesn't make it real. Give me an idea of what you want for it. I think around 45000 would be a fair offering. Let me have someone come down here and check it out. I've got a check for authenticity, game-worn. You know, there's a million little things that can make this worth money. Sure. Right, now, although we sir. can't prove that this is actually a game-worn jersey, this is 100% authentic jersey that Willie Mays was issued. Great, good to hear. Signed Godfather's script. The Godfather is a highly acclaimed drama film from 1972 that grossed over $286 million, established Marlon Brando as one of the greatest actors in history, and launched Al Pacino's career. I have a script of The Godfather. Okay. It came with a picture of The Godfather and an autograph inside by Al. You think it's the Al we're both thinking of? Yeah. It's uh, got a name embossed in the front, Robert Evans. Robert Evans was the producer. When a seller entered the pawn shop with an original script from the movie signed by Pacino, the shop was naturally interested. When The Godfather came out in 1972, it was an instant hit. Directed by Francis Ford Coppola, starring Marlon Brando, Al Pacino. I'm crossing my fingers it's Al Pacino. So I invited my buddy down to help me figure it out. What do we got here? A script from The Godfather. Signed by Al. The expert determined that the script was an original and the signature was authentic and suggested a retail price between one and two grand. Most of the time, Pacino only signed with Al. He didn't sign his last name if, if, unless it was a contract or a letter that he was sending to somebody very formal. And what I'm seeing is a really good flow. All the signatures that I've seen of Pacino, they have that little extra loop in the middle. That loop is there, and the way it connects to the L is consistent with his known signature based on the circumstances. This is Al Pacino's signature. Wow, that's great. All right, so what Al Pacino's signature worth on a script? Well, I'd say a high retail would be a couple thousand dollars, that at auction it might bring a thousand dollars. However, Rick offered the seller only 500 bucks, causing her to leave the deal. I'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> okay, okay. 500 bucks. Not a thousand, huh? No, I mean, the thing is, it's not an original script. 500 bucks, I think it's a fair price. So $500 is the best you can do? You can't shoot any higher than that? Told you it's the best offer I can do, it really is. Okay, thanks for your time. All right, well, thanks for bringing Thank it in. Thank you. The seller later discovered that the script was sold at an auction for $12,000. But it turned out that the script's signature was not done by Pacino, but by the producer, Al Grubby, which made the pawn shop's valuation incorrect and their handwriting expert's assessment unprofessional. Fake Watches Corey, the son of Rick Harrison, grew up in the family business. However, when he started working the night shift alone in his late teens, he had a difficult time distinguishing real from fake items. When I first started working the night shift, I didn't have that much experience here. And being the typical 18-year-old kid, I thought I knew everything. And it must have got around town pretty quick because I bought six fake Rolexes in one week. He was duped six times in one week, buying fake Rolexes from different sellers, which resulted in a loss of four grand to the business. I thought I was doing a great job, so I only spent about four grand on the six fake Rolexes. This would have been a severe mistake for anyone else, but Corey was given a second chance. With time and experience, he has become much better at his job and can now avoid major errors. Marilyn Monroe's Photo and Poem a customer named Jason brought in an autographed photo of Marilyn Monroe and a poem that he claimed was written by the star. I've got a Marilyn Monroe signed picture and a handwritten poem. Wow. As well as the obituary of the man that she wrote it to and his tags. This could be very valuable. Looks like she's swinging on a rope. Yes. In high heels, I'm sure that's really safe. <laughs> Corey, who is a fan of the actress, was excited about the potential value of the item. Before she was famous, she actually worked in a World War II munitions factory. And uh, they actually caught a few pictures over there, which, you know, snowballed into her actually getting a career. No celebrity today compares to Marilyn Monroe. I mean, she was practically royalty. If this is a genuine poem written by one of the biggest sex symbols of all time. We've got something really special here. 
Jason explained that he had purchased the item from an estate sale 15 years ago. Okay, where in the world did you get this? My father-in-law purchased it from an estate sale about 15 years ago. All right. To verify the item's authenticity, Corey had Jason read the poem to him and bring in a signature expert named Steve to verify the signature on the photo. All right, let's see how good of a poet she was. You see me on the silver screen, also on Life magazine. My master has been many men. You've seen us both time and again. On the ground or in the sky, where there is mischief, so am I. That's a good thing she was uh, known for her acting and not her poetry. So what was it appraised at? It was appraised at $48,000. All right, well, that's good to know. You got any paperwork with it? I don't have any paperwork. That's a shame. Without it, I don't have a lot to go on. I'll tell you what, mind if I have a buddy of mine come take a look at it? He works for PSA. They're one of the most reputable signature people there is out there. Wonderful. I'll be right back. Thank you very much. Steve explained that while the signature on the photo was not made by Monroe's hand, they still had the poem to examine. The first thing you have to remember with her autograph, kind of always rushed, kind of sloppy, but she kind of had a beauty to it too, kind of like her. And if you start to look at the exemplar here, this is signed off a contract here, and you can see how her M moves so flowing right into her signature. That's usually how she always signed her name. Now, something that's striking about this photo, the secretary used to sign a lot of her correspondence, used to like to use a red pen. And I'm gonna pull something up here to show you. This is a signature, it's pretty widely known throughout the industry. When we see these photos, we instantly know they're secretarial, and that's what we're looking at here. That's disappointing. However, upon further examination, Steve found that the handwriting in the poem did not match that of Monroe's. Next, I'd like to analyze the poem, and I brought a sample of her handwriting here today. This is signed earlier in the 50s, and you can see her pressure is very similar throughout. When I start to compare both of these together, you go over here to the poem, it's two different worlds. Yeah, they look absolutely nothing alike. Yeah. This was unfortunately penned in someone else's hand and not Marilyn Monroe's. And it could have been her sentiment. She might have shared that sentiment with someone that was writing for her, but she did not write that. Unfortunately, the item was determined to be fake. Corey expressed his disappointment, wishing that the item was authentic as it would have been worth a lot of money. I wish it were real, man. I mean, we'd both make a lot of money, but... Absolutely. I thought it was real. It's disappointing, but I, I very much appreciate your time. Have a nice day, man. Thank you very Take much. Take care. Too bad this isn't the real deal. It could have made the shop a lot of money. On the plus side, maybe in real life, she was a much better poet. Vic Flick Guitar. In season eight, Victor's studio musician brings in a 1961 Fender Stratocaster guitar to sell. Oh, this is your guitar? Yes. Okay. 1961 Fender Stratocaster. The guitar catches Rick's attention as he remembers watching Jimi Hendrix play the iconic instrument in his youth. That's a big wow factor right there. It certainly <laughs> is, yeah. My earliest memories of, you know, when I was a kid, you know, watching old videos of Jimi Hendrix play a white early 60s uh, Stratocaster, but he right. played it upside down. <laughs> it, it, yeah. <laughs> it's in pretty damn good shape. Despite his initial interest, Rick discovers that Vic Flick, the guitar's owner, is not a well-known musician and that the guitar has not been used in any major hit songs aside from the James Bond theme. This is how many albums you've been on? Well, albums and films. This is your name right here, Vic Flick? Vic Flick, that's my name, yeah. So you worked on films too? I worked on films, I worked on Goldfinger, James Bond. I actually played the James Bond theme, which... Uh... You, you played the James Bond theme? Yes. Rick buys the guitar for $55,000, but it does not sell well in the shop with a price tag of 90 grand. All right, um, we take 50 grand for it. I'm looking more towards the 70, maybe 65. I mean, it's nothing personal, I'm just thinking, I mean, you're sort of a rock star, and that, that's my quandary when I go to sell this. Um, um, do you go 60? I will go $55,000. All right. Deal. Yeah. Okay. Let's go do some paperwork. Okay. Cool. Ultimately, Rick decides to auction off the guitar, but it only sells for twenty thousand, resulting in a loss of thirty-five thousand dollars. Willie Mays' baseball uniform. The pawn business can be risky, especially when it comes to signed items, as there are many forgeries in circulation. People will often try to pass off fake items as real, as there is so much money to be made. What do we got? Hey, I got this 61 uh, Willie Mays uniform. I got this jersey with the matching pants underneath. 
You're bringing me in something here that's amazing. The home runs this guy could have hit in this uniform, the bases he stole, game-winning catches, all kinds of stuff. Which I'm sure he did in this uniform. In this case, the Pawn Stars were presented with a Willie Mays baseball jersey that looked like it could be accurate, but there were some signs that it may not be authentic. You bring in one of the one of the best baseball players of all time's actual uniform. Correct. Do you have any paperwork or anything with you? Or? No, I don't. Okay. This doesn't look game-worn. Willie Mays was a badass. He was sliding around in the dirt and the grass. I imagine there would be a bunch of stains on it. I mean, the jersey feels authentic. I just, there's, I have no way of telling for sure that it's real. I'm very confident it's real. I mean, the way you know, my family cherished it, and the way my uncle was a sports collector. And just because it was in your family doesn't make it real. Give me an idea of what you want for it. I think around 45000 would be a fair offering. I'm going to need a little bit of proof before I shell out that kind of money. Let me have someone come down here and check it out. I've got to check for authenticity, game-worn. You know, there's a million little things that can make this worth money. Sure. Right, wait I'll and see. Be right back. I'm going to make a phone call. What do we got? Check it out. It's a Willie Mays uniform. Despite these doubts, Corey decided to buy the jersey for $31,000. Now, although we can't prove that this is actually a game-worn jersey, this is 100% authentic jersey that Willie Mays was issued. Great, good to hear. This is absolutely extraordinary. This is one hell of a find. I would value this anywhere from 35 to 40 grand. Good yeah. news. Well, How much are you looking to get out of it? I'd like to get 45,000. And I'd like to be able to make some money. I'm not gonna go anywhere near that. I'll give you 20 grand for it. No, I, I can't. Did you uh, do 40? I've gotta make some money on it, man. I really do. I'll go about 22,000. This is so rare, I think we should be able to do better than that. 37? But 25,000, I'm not going any higher. I'm sorry, I don't think I'll be able to do that. 30 grand, this is the best I can do. Can you meet me at 33? $31,000, call it a day. Sounds good. All right, mm. John, take care of it. All right. However, when they attempted to sell it, they ultimately had to auction it off for 19,000, a significant loss. Belt buckles. A customer came into the pawn shop with a set of belt buckles claiming they were made by the 1850s Wells Fargo Company in collaboration with Tiffany before the merger in 1998. I came to the pawn shop today to sell my Wells Fargo belt buckles made by Tiffany. I like collecting antiques. It's uh, fun to keep the past alive. I was hoping to get, you know, 500 a piece just so I can get some more money to go buy some more antiques. The customer claimed he had bought the belt buckles from a museum in Montana in 1969 and showed a letter from Tiffany as evidence of their authenticity. So where did you get these? I got them here in town at a flea market. The guy I bought them from bought them from a museum in Montana in 1969, and this is the marking of Tiffany on the back. All three have it. Okay, do you know who these guys are? Mr. Wells and Mr. Fargo. That's correct. How much did you pay for these? 100 bucks. Okay. A genuine Wells Fargo and company belt buckle from Nevada from this time period made by Tiffany and Company would be worth tens of thousands of dollars. But these things are often faked. But I have a letter from Tiffany that says that they're real. Oh, you do? Mm-hmm. However, Rick was skeptical about the item and believed it could be a fake. He pointed out that the belt buckles were not made perfectly and the letter from Tiffany could easily have been forged. Your buckle was indeed made by Tiffany in mid last century for the thousands of employees of Wells Fargo and Company. Thank you for your interest, Tiffany and Company, C.H. Johnson, service manager. I never buy anything fake, no matter what. Just having it around the shop is risky because an employee might think it's genuine and sell it. That could turn into a real nightmare. He further explained that these belt buckles did not appear until the 1970s and that Tiffany would never make a belt buckle with a latch soldered over their logo. Tiffany would never make a belt buckle then solder the little latch over their logo. Anything associated with Tiffany was done perfectly. This is not perfectly, therefore I know it's not Tiffany's. And none of these belt buckles popped up until 1970-ish. Tiffany never made a belt buckle for him. But have you seen the letter before? If I'm gonna sell you a fake belt buckle, I wouldn't have a problem typing up a fake letter. This makes me feel terrible when this happens. At least it was only a hundred bucks. Yeah, it's been a lot worse. I never buy anything fake, no matter what. Wells Fargo Strongbox. Despite being highly intelligent and successful in the pawn business, Rick sometimes makes mistakes in identifying valuable items. This was the case when a customer came into the store selling a Wells Fargo ball and chain, which seemed too advanced for its claimed time period. All right, well, tell me about these things. 
This ball and chain right here uh, actually comes from the human prison. It's the oldest prison in the state of Arizona. Yeah, opened in the 1870s. Originally, it was a territorial prison. Arizona wasn't even a state when it opened up. Right. This one right here, it comes from Folsom Prison from around the late 1800s, 1900s. I know um, California did their hangings there. Right. Back in the day, a ball and chain kept prisoners from making a break for it. Dragging a big hunk of iron around would do that. Despite his suspicions, Rigg decided to purchase it for $450. Here's my concerns. When they forged chains back in the 1800s, it was just hot welding together. You know, get it hot, beat it together. 1800s, they didn't have arc welding. It was all done by a blacksmith. That's why I have a problem with these chains. They're electrically welded. And my other big concern, never in the history of any prison did they ever have their name put on the bolts. OK, so what are you trying to say? It's fake. What, what makes you an expert on this stuff? I've been buying and selling this stuff my entire life. Box, I'll give you 400 bucks for it. I want $1,200 for it. No, you don't. <laughs> I'll give you 400 bucks for the box, and I will get one of my guys to help you carry all this stuff out. 800. I just don't see me getting that kind of money out of it. I, I see me getting 600 bucks, maybe. I'd like to at least get $500 for it. I'll meet you in the middle of 450. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Pretty little filthy. Hey, thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> However, upon further examination by an expert, it was determined to be fake and worth nothing. Rick had taken a gamble with the purchase, but ultimately lost out on the deal. First things first, have you already bought this? That sounds bad. I've already bought it. I don't have good news for you. This is a complete fantasy piece. It's a complete fake. Damn it, Rick. It's one of the most faked items out there. I thought it was fake to start with. Well, then why didn't you say anything? I didn't want to bust your bubble. What, so you let me spend the money instead? Now I can holler at you. <laughs> Gibson Mandolin. Chumley is often portrayed as a bumbling character on the Pawn Stars, and in one episode from season four, he is left in charge of the shop while Rick and Corey are away. I have a Gibson Mandolin. Mind if I play a couple tones? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. All right, well, let me call my boss over here. Hey, Rick. Corey, Rick. I guess no one's here. No, I know a little bit about these things. A man comes in with a vintage Gibson mandolin he purchased at a yard sale, hoping to make a profit. I decided to come to the pawn shop today to sell my vintage Gibson mandolin. I picked it up at a yard sale. I'm looking to sell it today because I'd like to take the family on a trip to Ireland. I know the name Gibson, so I took a gamble and thought I would pick it up and hopefully I can make some money off it. Chum Lee, encouraged by his colleague's interest in a similar mandolin, exceeds his $1,000 purchase limit and buys the mandolin for $1,500. It's in great condition. You can see the craftsmanship on it is phenomenal. Yeah, that's the one thing about these Gibsons, you know? They only use the best parts. Right. I see the sticker in there. It tells me that this is authentic. Great. Maybe we can make a deal. What are you trying to get for well, it? Well, I'd like to get three grand out of it if I could. Would you be willing to go uh, any less? Because normally, you know, I actually have a spending limit of a thousand bucks. I'm not supposed to go any higher than that. It's not the end of the world for me if I don't sell it. I don't mind walking out of here with it. How about 1300? 1300. What do you say 1895? I mean, you see the shape it's in. It's a little dust, but it's fine. I'll go 14 and that's pushing the barrel. 1500 and we got a deal. 15 sounds fair. I can make a 15? profit. All right, that sounds good. I appreciate it. However, it turns out that the mandolin is fake and worth only 100 bucks. This results in a loss of $1,400 for Chum Lee, who is trying to impress Rick. There's a couple things here. The decal, you can see where it was cut out with some scissors. On this mandolin, it would have been inlaid or silk screened. It wouldn't even have been a decal. And it's not even a G that Gibson ever used. And the finish. It's like plastic. Gibsons are covered in a lacquer finish, and this pick guard is totally wrong. This is something Gibson never even used. This is fake as hell, man. This is... I just paid $1,500 for that. Is it worth anything? Maybe about 100 bucks. All right. Yeah, dude, sorry about that. Thanks for the bad news. All right. Call me anytime you got any questions, dude. I hate mandolins. <laughs> This is where we'll end our video. We hope you enjoyed watching. Make sure to comment, hit the like and subscribe buttons, hit the notification bell for more videos like this, and share this video with your family and your friends. See you soon.